Esther present for about 16 minutes, and then I will invite Esther's advisor, Brittany Johnson, up um, to say a few words about them and give them the whole lot of honor stole and cord. Very exciting. And then um, we'll have time for Q&A. So please take notes, think about your questions, your comments, everything you want to say to Esther. And without further ado, let's give Esther another hand. Writing minor, and for the past year, I've been studying attitudinal barriers towards disability on a college campus. So let's get started with research. There we go. First of all, let's talk about what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to give y'all some background. What is disability in the first place? How has it interacted with higher education? Then I'm going to go into the specific study that I created and designed. And then we'll talk about some findings. I'll leave you with a conclusion and plans for further policy research. So first of all, what is disability? Disability traditionally has been exceptionally hard to define. The reason for this is that there are narrow legal definitions that have to exist. For instance, you can apply for disability through the government. But that's not the full experience of being a disabled individual. There are a lot of disabled people who never get disability checks. And there are a lot of people who get disability checks that might not identify with disability. For this reason, I created my own operational definition, which you can see on the screen right here. That reads, the persistent inability due to either one's physical, mental, or intellectual functioning to engage with society in the way it is expected. The reason I created this definition is because there are so many competing models of disability. Is disability simply a medical diagnosis, or is it a interaction with society that is this definition encompasses both. And moving forward with my research, keep that paragraph in mind. Next, let's talk about a history of disability. Disability has been around since the beginning of time, but it's not always been called that. <coughs> Coincidentally, disability has interacted with higher education since the inception of higher education. The first place in which it really interacted was during institutionalization. This happened mostly during the early 1900s, but keep in mind, Dates are just meant to be a placeholder here, they're not exact. Now, institutions often exist very parallel to college campuses, with a couple being literally on a college campus. For instance, Harvard and Miami University of Ohio both had institutions either right next door or on their campus. The medical providers at those universities experimented on people in institutions, and to this day, there are brains in Harvard, there are brains in people from institutions. Moving forward, we have a period of intense exclusion in higher education for disabled individuals. This exclusion took place both because of physical barriers, campuses were not accessible, and because of attitudinal barriers. Next, we have the Civil Rights Era. This is when people started to really push back against that idea that disabled people could not be in a college space. They did this through a very amount of social movements. So for instance, the 504 protests where sit-ins happened for over a month in various government buildings, and the Gallup death riots, where death president now was chanted all across Washington, D.C. Now, following the Civil Rights era, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act. This is where we are now. The Americans with Disabilities Act is the first piece of scoping civil rights legislation that exists for disabled individuals, and protects all disabled individuals that are going to college campuses that receive federal funding, which, by the way, is like, most of them. So then, what is the problem? If we have the ADA, why are we sitting here talking about this? Shouldn't that be enough? It's not. The way that the ADA functions is that if something is inaccessible or discriminatory, I can sue the school. It's not a law. Police are not going to come out and arrest the person that did the inaccessible thing. They're just going to give me some money in reparation for that. That doesn't protect disabled students from discrimination, inaccessibility, or attitudinal barriers. To this day, people, even on this campus, are reporting discrimination, harassment, and attitudinal barriers. I want to look at why, which brings me to my study today. So I conducted three surveys, each with about 50, 60 questions, one to faculty, one to staff, and one to students. The faculty one was simple random sampling. A survey went out to every faculty member, on a college campus. If you are a faculty member here, you've got an email to take my survey. If you didn't take my survey, I'm disappointed in you. <laughs> <laughs> the staff survey was a little bit more inclusive. I did purpose of sampling to make sure 
that it was staff that worked with students. So my fellow RAs in this room, they didn't take my survey. I'm disappointed in you. <laughs> students, however, was even more purposive. I looked specifically at disabled students to make sure that their experiences got counted. So those were the only barriers that were placed on access to my surveys. You had to be over 18, which is an IRB thing, it wasn't me. You had to identify as disabled if you're a student, and you had to work with students if you're a staff. My survey was mixed methods. I used quantitative and qualitative data analysis to make sure that I was truly gaining the understanding of the experiences. I used the descriptive statistics to find common themes among the quantitative data, and I used thematic coding with the qualitative data to identify where people intersected. With that in mind, let's talk about my findings. So this first thing on the screen you'll see is kind of what I consider to be the linchpin of my research. I asked an open-ended question, reading the process to obtain the 504 letter to the school is blank. The faculty weren't given any word options, neither were students. They could fill in their answer with anything they wanted. Surprisingly, the answers fell into pretty similar categories. These are word clouds of every response given. On the left is faculty, and on the right is student. As you can see, there's a pretty big disparity. Something important that I think you know is that the faculty one hinges on the students the most. For context, the bigger the word, the more times the response was given. The student one hinges on the words like SES and similar varieties to faculty, but also highlights 504, which is specific vocabulary that surprisingly doesn't show up at all in the faculty. After I looked at all of the data, I broke it down by theme, which leads me to this graph here. So I wanted to make it easy for y'all, so I created some boost on this so that you could understand kind of the picture of the faculty people that were filling out this survey. The first persona we have is Critical Carlos. And critical Carlos is not afraid to point out a disparity in his one. Well. He's ready to critique the system. He's ready to point out the flaws or where it takes too long. Critical Carlos had five responses coded. They say things like it was bureaucratic and filled with staff barriers. Difficult or costly, difficult came up quite a few times. The next persona we have is Dono Daniel. Dono Daniel doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> we hope to fix that. One of the responses to the process of data by before letter is, it's emailed to me. Another one is that they're unfamiliar with the process. The next is knowledgeable Canancy. Knowledgeable for Nancy knows what's going on. We all want to be Nancy. Processes in Knowledgeable Nancy, which include seven responses, include provide documentation to the SDS office and reach out to the SDS staff and present information from your position. That's a pretty accurate description of how we get a 504. The next is SDS Shana. SDS Shana doesn't really want to hand it in. They're happy to pass it off to Student Disability Services and say that that's the entire process, which is a little bit inaccurate. There were 13 of these. Answers include, not sure, I send them to SES. Go to SES and they will assist you and through SES. Now, there are some similarities between Knowledgeable Nancy and SES Shana, so I wanted to kind of point out why I coded some responses differently. The key to being put in Nancy's category versus Shana's was that you understand the documentation process necessary, that you're not just saying SDS is going to figure it out for you, because that's inaccurate. Next is Descriptive Diana. Descriptive Diana just provided an adjective to the question, to so all of those responses have been <coughs> There are 20 of those, including laborious, straightforward, challenging, and fine, a very passive-aggressive period. <laughs> the last one is Student's Responsibility Steve. Student Responsibility Steve puts all of the emphasis on the student it's their job to solve their accommodation problems. Students Responsibility Steve had six responses, and one of them clearly states a student and SDS responsibility. I did the same thing for students because I wanted to see the difference. So, back to Critical Carlos. There were seven of these, and all of them were talking about how it was, the process was either unknown or super duper frustrating for students. Don't know, Daniel also had nine references coded. A lot of people, even disabled students on campus, either don't use 504s or don't understand the process. There's still an adequate gap there. Next, Knowledgeable Nancy. Knowledgeable Nancy only had three responses coded. They were very accurate, but not many. SDF Shana had also 
three references coded. One I found interesting was one that said, absolutely no idea. My SES officer always did it for me. That's interesting to me. The script that Diana had five, including, okay, straightforward and grueling. Students' responsibility to see had no answers coded. Next, we move on really quickly to my quantitative data. These are the direct questions that were asked of students, or of faculty. I took an immediate response and coded it into agree, neutral, and disagree. So if you want to take a moment to read these, I'm not going to read all of them, but I'm going to highlight a couple that I find very interesting. The one that I find the most interesting is the one that says, we're not going to do that again. <laughs> the one that says, the only time I discuss disability with my students is when they're struggling academically. Faculty emphatically disagree with that statement. We move on to students, so we find something very interesting. One of the last points here, I said I'm not going to do it again, and I'm doing it, is uh, that students agree with the statement that they only discuss disability with their faculty when they're struggling academically. This points out a disparity between the way that faculty understand disability in conversations about it and the way that students do. Additionally, the student experiences are very depressing. Students agree that they feel pressure to disclose their disability to get accommodation needs met. They agree that they have the burden of educating faculty, advisors, and peers on disability. They feel like people expect less of them due to their disability. And they feel like they have to disclose the details of their disability as a kind of exchange for accessibility. Students also are not sure or are neutral that they know how to report an incident of bias due to disability that they feel like reporting that bias would change things. Furthermore, I took some direct responses from qualitative data, asking students to discuss the harassment that they had experienced on campus, bias or inaccessibility. This is what students directly have to say. This student reports bullying in their freshman year. This student reports harassment to this day of people not believing their disability. This student was denied access to an accommodation that would allow them to further their education. This student believes that the 504 office treats them like they want accommodations because they are lazy. And this student talks about accommodations on work and trying to suck it up to compensate for their disability. I don't know who the day is, I wish I did. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because at the end of the day, the most important thing about my research is the student experience. One student experiencing any of these things is enough to point out an issue on our college campus. We can look back to the history of disability and how it has been treated on college campuses to know that there is a precedent for this that we are going up against generations upon generations of mistreatment. And while, sure, it's better than it was in the 1800s, not going to argue with you there, there's still a lot of room for improvement. This leads me to my conclusions and my next steps. The first conclusion that I would like to note is that there's a disconnect between faculty and student understandings. Student experience of disability is different than how faculty understand it. How can we increase that understanding? The second thing I would like to note is that one student is enough. If students are reporting bias and access, if they're reporting feeling exhausted by the advocacy required to get their education, what can we do about it? This leads me to my suggestions for further education. I would suggest workplace and classroom accessibility training, advocacy education, and then this is my shameless plug for something I really want to air and else. This is my shameless plug, disability ally training. One student experiencing bias, harassment, or discrimination is enough. We must continue to research the problem of disability and accessibility, but we must also implement changes in our administration and our policy. Thank you so much.
time done Essex is like the spring time. Her reputation has preceded herself, obviously. And every time I've mentioned to any of my students or any faculty that I'm working with you on your um, research or if you're letting me tag along <laughs> with you on this ride, everyone is like, oh, Esther, she's such a powerhouse. Alex said it like 20 minutes ago as well. So just continually just impressed by your work ethic and more than that, just your passion and the passion that you bring to everything that you do, especially this really important topic. And I know you're going to do like, so much more with this. She's not even a senior yet. <laughs> so like, lots of more. Lots more to yeah. see. So, congratulations. And I get to give you all of this. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, I'd like to what echo what you had said about your presentation, fantastic work, your fantastic job of uh, presenting. Um, in your research, have you found any potential kinds of harm that may be implemented if it doesn't have a type of intersectional lens? Um, specifically when it comes to offices that may offer one type of accommodations without uh, considering uh, race, gender, sexuality, uh, nationality, first gen status, or undocumented status? So absolutely. So throughout, um, especially public school and middle and high school, special education programs, something that people don't really know, is the reason that special education programs got created mm -hmm. was because Brown v. Board of Education got passed sure. and schools didn't like that. They didn't want desegregation to happen. So what they did as a little workaround was they created special education. And they, at a much higher rate, began diagnosing black kids with, especially black men, mm -hmm. with disabilities such as ADHD, but especially the hyperactive type, autism, things like that, behavioral issues, putting them in special education classrooms. So, all of that's happening in high school, right? College is desegregated, college doesn't have special education. That's still carrying over. There are still differences in the way that black individuals are getting accommodations and documentation versus white individuals. Mm -hmm. Additionally, there is a barrier of class. Mm -hmm. Documentation is expensive, mm -hmm. especially for learning disabilities. Documentation can cost upwards of $2,000. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. Most disabled individuals live below the poverty line. It's about two thirds. Mm -hmm. Disabled college students may not have support from their family, especially depending on the intersecting identities, right. to get that documentation. That's why while the documentation office is great, it's not the definition of a disability on campus. That's why when we're looking at how do we help disabled students, we can't say, well, we can help the students who have 504s alone. Mm -hmm. Because 504s are cost prohibitive. We, you don't have to pay for accommodations, but you do have to pay for accommodations, if that makes sense. So whenever we look to disability allyship and working towards reducing barriers for our disabled students, we have to keep in mind that one, a 504 is not the only answer, and two, there are layers of discrimination baked into everything with disability. We can't look at it in a vacuum. First question is um, going back to the survey. I believe they were anonymous, but I wasn't they clear were. on that. Okay. Um, no, personally, I didn't find information of any kind was created. Perfect. Okay. So it, it created an environment where they could be clear and transparent. Yes. And then the other piece is, um, do you have active collaboration and or support among the students um, with disabilities? Because I know um, the organization exists, and I know that you have active collaboration, but were you able to um, gather information from the organization and incorporate some of that in your, your findings? Yeah, so for these surveys specifically, while I'm pretty sure that most of DSO filled them out because I didn't collect personally identifying information, I didn't really want to put any sort of pressure on the members of DSO to fill this out. Um, something that I had originally considered doing for my data was a series of focus groups. Uh, I voted against that, one, because trying to code surveys and then trying to code focus groups was too much, and I did not want to do it. But two, I also wanted at least at first to open this conversation in a platform where students did not feel that if they reported some sort of discrimination, there could be a harm to them. Mm -hmm. I feel like it is possible to create that group of trust. Um, we were just in Courtney's presentation where she was talking about a way that she did it. but. There's a lot of fear going into the idea that my professor is not accommodating me. Everybody loves them. I don't know what to do. So I wanted to remove as much of that as possible and give as much of an avenue for people to be honest. So I tried to remove myself as much as possible from a person who being like, take hey, out my survey. I think I did that to like three or four people that I already knew were going to be honest with me um, so that there would be that level of trust. Thank you so much. Well, let's do one more question. Let's see what goes in. Um, with your research, are there currently any plans to take that research to 
a policymaker of some kind, rather that's whether that's for policy on campus, statewide or citywide policy. So this research specifically, I don't know how applicable it would be to statewide city policy simply because it's so St. Edward's focused. While I do think it shows the precedent for discrimination barriers on college campuses, I, because it's only students, faculty, and staff at St. Edward's, not sure how applicable this specific research is statewide yet. There's a strong yet there. Um, in regards to policy on campus, I personally feel like I get very involved in disability policy and I don't intend to stop. So this research, like any good research, can inform what we are doing. It should inform what we are doing. It's good data. <laughs> we may as well use it. Um, so that we can continue strides that we've been making without access to this information, that this information will empower us to make so much better. Notice that the students and staff are really well represented and faculty are not as much. And it, it is just uh, figure out ways that we can take extra research um, and the advocacy that she's been doing and the DSOs have been doing and not make the students make all these changes, but like we can do these things ourselves, right? So let's like continue this conversation, rely on her, not like rely on her, you know what I'm saying? Like listening to her.